By three or four in the morning, he'd lost control of his bodily functions. And we had change of clothes. And his mannerism, he, he, he wasn't talking sense. He wasn't, there's no logic in his, in his speech. You couldn't understand half of what he was saying. He'd pace up and down the cell, looking at us, walking up and down. Waiting, waiting all the time. Kept asking one of us, what time is it? What time is it? He didn't sleep at all that night. He'd lie on the bed, he'd pace up and down. The cell was smelling. It was a long, hard night. But what touched me most of all, <clears throat> I'm getting a bit emotional over this, but nevertheless, before we went off duty, we were relieved by, by other officers who came and relieved us. He came over to that table in the middle of the room, shook my hand and said, all the best, tough. You haven't been too bad to me, sis. Fair play. When I woke up in the morning, there was the awful realization of what had to happen in that day. And my first ministry that I had to conduct would be in those circumstances, and the feeling of tremendous nervousness. We got the man's drop from the official table of drops, and we carefully marked this out on the, on the rope, because it had got to be exact. And then set the rope up so that the hood uh, the noose was just level with the head of the man. I'd tie it up with, with, with pack thread. Uh, and, uh, and we'd go back uh, to where we our belly it until about five minutes to nine. If, you, if the man was a communicant, he would want to make his communion. Um, if he wasn't, he, there would be prayers to be said. Sometimes the man would want to, to share scripture reading. Um, I would always allow at least an hour. What we did was to um, gather in the governor's office. And the persons that um, were necessary to be present, which would be the governor, the medical officer, and in London, one of the sheriffs, I was uh, nervous. Uh, the thought of it uh, worried me, I, I suppose. Um, and it's, a, it's not your best time of day, eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, and uh, uh, I suppose... I suppose nervous was the, was the reaction on the eve and then I got up and you dressed in your sombre dress and attended at the prison, go into the governor's office. Well, I, I needed to know in order to bring this thing towards its, its spiritual end as well as its physical end. I needed to know um, when to um, cut the service short uh, and when to move on to the next prayers that I was going to say with the man. Um, I didn't want him to be aware that I was aware. <laughs> I wanted him to rest in, 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 in this activity of the, of the sacramental communion. And, and so I would not wear a watch. I would ask the officer who was either kneeling be alongside him or kneeling just behind him, or standing behind him, to raise his hand and finger to me when it was um, 10 to 8. 10 to 9, I beg your pardon, 10 to 9. And then he would raise it again when it was 5 to 8. Because the, 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 the execution was going to come in on the dot of 9 o'clock, dead on 9 o'clock. And then we all uh, uh, troop out of the governor's office and go round to the uh, block where the actual apparatus of execution 
Uh, uh, what would I do? I met the governor in the prison centre about five to nine, walked it, walked along that landing over the coconut mat in which he'd put down to dead in our footsteps. And if it had been quiet the night before, and it was ten times quieter, you could have heard a, nearly heard a, a pin drop. The one I can remember vividly is the, um, the man who'd been confirmed two days before and was very calm, sustained by his um, newfound faith um, of us making our communion together, of the uh, two officers in, uh, looking after him, having asked that they also might make their communion, of those two officers kneeling alongside this man and my communicating the, the three of them and finishing the service with still three minutes to go and uh, talking to him until the point when I said to him, well, would you now stand up? The governor said, right. He went a bit further through the next door into the gallows chamber. We went through the unlocked door of the condemned cell. There was the man in the corner, and I think that this was a put-up job with his back towards us, sitting talking to the parson. As soon as the executioner came in and the man's hands were pinioned, and then he had to walk not very far from the condemned cell through the door into the execution shed. And then he turned around and looked at us, and there were the most terrified eyes I've ever seen in my life. But he, he never made a protest. He didn't say anything at all. N none of them ever did. And uh, it just went very quickly. My going with him saying um, a prayer that I... And he saying it, a prayer that I'd, I'd taught him. The man didn't know until he turned then and saw it that the gallows was only 14 feet away. And when he did turn, all he could see was pier points back and the noose hanging down. And uh, it must have been quite alarming for him. May the baby of Bethlehem be mine to tend. May the boy of Nazareth be mine for a friend. May the man of Galilee my soul defend. Um, that then God, your holy angel, send that I may see thee at the end. By this time, then, we were all assembled, and the executioner would put the cap over his head and adjust the rope. The other executioner then does the similar tying of legs to stop them moving around. Well, we'd done at the same time. He tapped my shoulder and I got to get up, and as soon as I saw I was off the trap door, he, I don't say sprang, but went over to the lever, which was about five feet away, and shoved it over and down the man went. And he was dead. <laughs> I immediately went to the officer's mess. I was smoking those days, as I said. I ordered a cup of tea. I didn't want breakfast, obviously. The last thing I thought about. I was a little bit of tight upset because he'd wished us cheerio before we went out to the cell. I sat there and had a smoke. And I sat in the officer's mess and so the execution took place. And I could hear this church clock, this tower clock chiming. And I was in the officer's mess, with, which was outside the uh, prison. And I sat there drinking this tea, smoking this fag, and listening to this clock and thinking to myself, well, that's it. It's all over. Well, the body would be examined immediately on the rope and then left for after one hour before being taken down. This would merely be to allow any sort of automatic muscular activity and so on to, to cease. We very, very often get a certain amount of, uh, let's say, irritation 
in the nervous system and sometimes uh, the heart will continue beating. Now, this does not mean that the death hasn't taken place. We were led by the governor back to his office, but through the prison, and that meant passing the cell in which the uh, uh, condemned man had spent the night. And his door was open, and there was his bed, uh, with the bedclothes thrown back, pajamas on the bed, and um, empty cup of tea on the de bedside table, all very domestic. And uh, again, it brought home to you that uh, here's a man who's just spent a night uh, in a fairly normal, one would think, sort of bedclothes and bedside drink, uh, and uh, he's just been killed. He's just dead. And it was uh, that was uh, upsetting. So when we got in that case, when we got back to the governor's office, in spite of the, it being still very early in the morning, we did accept his offer of a drink. I'm very pleased to have it. The coroner has to inquire into the death of a prisoner wherever it takes place, whether it takes place in the prison hospital whether it takes place in an outside hospital or whether it's the result of a judicial execution. In the case of executions, the coroner and his jury come into the prison and the verdict of death by judicial hanging is recorded. I was asked, do I recognize that as the body of the man that I arrested? And I said, yes. And we were then shown out, thanked, and that was it. I went outside and took a deep breath, lit a cigarette, but I didn't have any regrets. I'd done my job and justice had been served. Finally, the body is taken from the post-mortem room to the prison cemetery and buried in an unmarked grave. The position of the graves is, is plotted, and they are usually buried uh, up to three deep. They still had to be the funeral or the burial. The chaplain did that as well. And that was uh, a lonely occasion with just the governor and the foreman of works and uh, a workman to fill in the graves. A very lonely, tragic moment. Well, my wife asked me to go to the doctor, and I went to the doctor. And he, he, he treated me for a, a nervous div exhaustion, or I forget what he called it, but I took two weeks off from work, and I was glad of those two weeks. So I don't know what, what, I, what I would have been like if I'd have taken him in the cell. I was glad to go off at six. If I'd have had to take him in that cell, probably I'd have cracked up. I don't know. I was glad of that fortnight off when I got back to Swansea. I mean, I slept badly for about three months. Uh, and I would think, had I had any any doubts in my mind uh, about uh, uh, the man's uh, uh, guilt or innocence, and I wasn't in a position to, to, to form a proper opinion because I hadn't been all the way through the trial. But if I'd had any doubts, I, I think I would have. Uh, it would have been more than three months that I'd been having nightmares about it. But I did have uh, have have trouble sleep for about three months. I I didn't sleep for nights before, I certainly didn't sleep for nights afterwards. I found it a corrosive experience, um, a, a sordid experience. I felt sullied and dirty um, as a result of it. And it's left its mark. I still have nightmares. Uh, all I can say is I felt justified that the man who had murdered somebody else had been have been put to death in the manner approved by law. 
it was, it was just a job. I didn't feel any emotion about it. Just a job. <laughs>